Okay, with this video, we'll look at integration by parts. We'll look at a derivation of the formula we use for integration by parts. We'll look at the tabular method, which is a kind of shortcut to do integration by parts. It would work in any integration by parts uh, question. And then we'll do some examples. Okay, so first I'll run through the derivation of the integration by parts formula. We begin with the product rule. Derivative of uv is u prime v plus uv prime. And here I'll just write it in a slightly different way to uh, highlight how I'm taking derivatives with respect to x on each side. Now imagine if I integrate both sides with respect to x. Something that I had taken a derivative with respect to x, I will now integrate with respect to x on both sides. And so a derivative with respect to x that's integrated with respect to x, I'll just get the product uv left over. And on this side, I'm going to separate it into two terms and cancel the dx. And then I'll move this term over to the left-hand side and then rewrite it. So this is it. This is my formula for integration by parts, the basic formula of how integration by parts works. I think of it as like a situation where I might have an expression u another expression that I can call dv, I'll look at this as a place, an opportunity for a trade where I have u that I might want to switch for differential in u and I might have differential in v that I would switch for just the expression v. And if this is an easier integral to find, then it's worth the trade. Along with the trade will come this product here, u times v minus this integral that you change it into that's hopefully an easier integral. All right, let's look at some examples. Okay, so when you do integration by parts, you look for something that the, a part of the integrand that the derivative would be simpler, another part where the antiderivative wouldn't be more complicated, and that's the trade you're looking for. So let's say we'll take u equal x and the differential in v equal to all of this sine x dx. This is a detail when you're doing it this way that you, you need to pick u and dv. And when you do dv, you've got to include dx or whatever the variable of integration is. Right, so the dv goes with the dx. Right? Now I can find the differential relation here and say differential in u would be a differential in x. The derivative with of u with respect to x is 1, but I write it in this differential form. Now I try to find an antiderivative, basically go back to figure out what v is. If this is the differential in v, I want to know what v is. So I'm really just integrating, but I'm integrating this uh, with respect to x. So of course that's going to be actually negative cosine, right? Because the derivative of cosine is minus sine. I've got to put an extra negative. So it's a detail that comes with really understanding how this works, that you've got um, the differential in v and the differential x that go here and differentials that go here. Also there's maybe one other thing I could jump in here and um, uh, highlight how look at the pattern that I have d and I mean I'm sorry I have u and du like a derivative that went this way and I have v here and dv so sort of a derivative going this way. Oh another thing that when we're doing integration by parts in this form what I basically I'm looking at is is this bottom row something I can integrate? Is it possible to integrate v du? Because I had u dv. I'm looking to see if I can switch it for v du. And how does that v du look? Well, it's c negative cosine x with respect to x. Yeah, we can definitely integrate that. So we'll say x sine x is, and then you, because the uh, formula for parts is integral u dv is uv minus integral with a switch here where you have v du. So then I would multiply u times v minus now the integral of v du. So that's the bottom row. All right, so now simplifying. This is a negative times a negative. And that was the trade that was worth it because, of course, integrating cosine x is easier than the original question. And that's the answer for that one. Now I'd like to do the exact same problem, but use this thing called the tabular method because it really does help a lot, especially when the integration by parts has to be iterated and repeated several times 
within itself. This really organizes the whole process. You can use this on any integration by parts method. What I do now is say, let's find a function f and another function g. Now, just like in any integration by parts method, sometimes this guy might actually have to be a 1. Uh, and that's kind of a hard thing to spot. It just takes lots of examples. But in this case, um, well, in every case, f is a function where I want to do derivatives. And g is a function where I want to do antiderivatives. So let's pick x because a derivative is simpler. And sine x because an antiderivative isn't more complicated. When you do it in the tabular method, you don't have to write the dx's and the dv's and du's and things like that. We just find functions, although, like I said, one of them might be a 1 in some cases. All right, so on this column, I'm always doing derivatives, x, and then 1, and then 0. And on this column, I'm always doing antiderivatives, so minus cos x. And then an antiderivative of minus cosine, well, let's see, it would have to be minus sine because the derivative of sine is cosine, and we have to include the negative. OK, so you can read your answer from this information. What we'll do is always uh, include a plus, minus, and a plus along here, always alternating. I'll get to that maybe in a minute exp for the explanation. And then always I'm going to multiply this factor times this factor, this guy times this guy, and then I multiply across the bottom row. And that bottom row is always an integral. But often, if you have a 0, you're integrating 0, and that just gives you a constant. But not every example. So hopefully I'll get one in here where this bottom row, this doesn't have a 0, and we have to integrate that expression. But that expression there is the one that you um, integrate that would be the sort of trade-off. Um, actually, you could even look at it here. We could be integrating this row, which is just cosine, just like we did before. Uh, but when you do top of your method, if you're going to get 0, it's just natural to go all the way to 0. Let's read the answer. Multiply here, that's negative x cos x plus, and then multiply here, that's sine x, and that's it. All right, so now this is an example where integration by parts is required, but the tabular method makes it much easier because otherwise, if you were doing it with u's and v's, you'd have this iteration of integration by parts within integration by parts, and it could get pretty complicated trying to keep track of it. This tabular method just cleans that all up, makes it really uh, straightforward. So find some function you want to do derivatives in some function you want to do antiderivatives. You're looking for derivatives to get simpler and antiderivatives to not get worse. So it's pretty clear what to choose in this case. Let's go with x to the fourth and sine x, right? Because derivatives will definitely get simpler here and antiderivatives will just oscillate between sine and cosine and they don't get any worse, any harder to integrate. So we'll get 4x to the third and then 12x squared 24x, 24, and then finally we're going to hit 0. Finding antiderivatives, let's see, we'll have to do cosine with a negative, because derivative of cosine is minus sine, and the negative has to compensate. And then negative sine, so derivative of sine is cosine. And then I'll have cosine, just cosine, because the derivative of cosine is minus sine, and then sine. And then one more, finally, it's back to where we were. It's going to be negative cosine x, because derivative of cosine is minus sine, and I need a negative to compensate. OK. And like I said, every time I do this tabular method, I need to include plus and minus and plus, minus, plus, minus. They always have to alternate. Now, getting back to why that is, it's because what I'm really doing is integration by parts. In each one of these rows is another integration by parts. And so in the integration by parts formula, there is that negative. And so it's sort of the effect of that negative distributing among two more terms that come from integration by parts. So it's the nesting of integration by parts within itself, and it's negative that keeps alternating this sign. All right. So I'm going to multiply this term times that term. So you never actually use that in the answer except to get the next row. This one times this one this one times this one, multiply this way, 
multiply that way, multiply that way, and then you multiply across the bottom and you integrate the bottom, but in this case again, I've got a zero, so that integral of that bottom row that's just integrating zero, it's just gonna produce the constant. So we can read the answer off. It's gonna be negative x to the fourth cos x, and then positive 4x cubed sine x plus, and then multiplying here, multiplying here, then multiplying this um, last uh, diagonal, and that's a negative, isn't it? Okay, that's it. I think I got my answer right there. Okay, so here's our answer for, for this one. Let's move on to another. Take a look at just integrating ln x. You can do this one also by a tabular method. With the tabular method, I set up some function where I want to do derivatives, another function where I want to do antiderivatives. I'm looking for some function that gets simpler in the derivatives, and another one that, that doesn't get any more complicated when I do antiderivatives, and I look for some result that I can integrate. So in, in this case, uh, what will work is actually to choose ln x because it, in some sense, gets simpler because you get a 1 over x, uh, and then choose 1 for the function g, and then an antiderivative would just be x when you integrate with respect to x. At this point, you realize I'm not going to go to 0, but this bottom row is now something that I can integrate. x times 1 over x is just 1, and that we can integrate. So we'll do a plus and a minus, multiply this diagonal, multiply across here. It's not a zero, so I'll need to actually integrate that. We've got the integral of ln x with respect to x is multiplying here, x ln x, and then minus. Okay, maybe I'll say it like this. It's always plus with every single term. And in this case, it's plus this last row. And because that last row is not zero, it doesn't have a zero in it, it's going to be an integral of this product with respect to x. So I get x ln x plus the integral of negative 1 uh, with respect to x. So x ln x minus x plus a constant. Okay, that's that one. Now let's move on to this one. This one um, you'll see that we can do with integration by parts. We'll choose two functions, one where we do derivatives, one where we do antiderivatives. In this case, it's not clear which, which to choose, and really, it'll work either way. You really could switch either way, because on the one hand, if you choose e to the 3x, the derivatives uh, really uh, stay pretty much the same. You keep getting e to the 3x with constants. And here, the antiderivative anti just oscillate. Uh, and it would be the same if you switched, right? Derivatives would also oscillate between sine and cosine. So if we do it this way, that'll work. But we will never get to 0, but that's all right. We'll get 3e to the 3x as our first derivative. And then taking another derivative, you'll get 9 e to the 3x, and now you're wondering, well, how long do we have to go? So you might do a couple of these, and then look over here at antiderivatives and see what, you're looking at that bottom row and thinking, is it something I can integrate? Well, an antiderivative for this, we know that the derivative of cosine is minus sine, so let's put cosine 4x. Its derivative would be minus sine 4x times a 4. So I'll compensate for that times 4 um, and negative, right? Derivative cosine is negative sine, so I need to compensate for the negative and compensate for the extra 4 in the chain rule. Okay, then I'll do another antiderivative, so I'll get another 1 fourth, so I'll need a negative 1 over 16 sine 4x because derivative sine is cosine, and that extra 4 comes out, so I need to compensate for it. Now this just looks terrible. It looks like it's just not getting any better at all. We could be doing this uh, for hours and this video will never end. Uh, 
but actually what I'm looking for is exactly what's happening here. It's another scenario that works out for integration when you can take the original integral and write it in terms of itself. So that's what I'm looking for. I have e to the 3x and sine 4x and I have no concern about these constants. Constants are easy to deal with in calculus, right? So, so this is perfect. This is exactly what I need to see that it returned back to the original integrand. So I can write this integral as several terms and times itself and then I can solve for it. So let's continue from here. We'll go plus, minus, plus, because that's part of the tabular method. We'll multiply here and multiply here, multiply across the bottom. This will be an integral. So we have the integral of e to the 3x sine 4x with respect to x is this product plus the next product, which happens to be positive because the two negatives cancel. So that's 3 over 16 e to the 3x sine 4x, right, when I multiply here. And then plus an integral that is this bottom row. So that bottom row is an integral of 9 e to the 3x negative 1 over 16 sine 4x integrated with respect to x. So what's so important about this is recognizing that I have a factor of e to the 3x and a factor of sine 4x and here I have a factor of e to the 3x and sine 4x don't care about the constants. I have the integral. All right, so what's really so important to realize here is that we've got the integral written in ter as a bunch of terms plus some factor times the original integral. It's, it's kind of like what's happening is that um, going through this integration by parts, I'm reaching this point where it seems completely hopeless. But right at that moment, it's like some kind of dramatic uh, scene in a movie, right, where you thought everything was completely just going wrong and it was, it was hopeless. That's the moment where the solution uh, becomes apparent because that exact product appearing there means that now you can bring this integral over to the other side, combine like terms, and you've got the answer. Um, so let's do that. The next step would be, the next step would be to factor out uh, the constants. And then here's the crucial idea. This integral can be added on the other side of the equal and combined because they are the same integral. So add 9 over 16 times this integral and then add it on the other side. And when you add on this side, because they are both the same integral, think of this as if it was 16 over 16. Like you've got 1x plus 9 over 16x. Well, you have to combine like terms. And actually, I would have 16 over 16 plus 9 over 16. That's 25 over 16 times that so-called x, that unknown, that unknown is the actual thing that we're solving for, just like we're solving an equation. It's actually linear in the integral. Theoretically, you could consider putting a plus c to be uh, right in really technical terms. Uh, to be precise, I could add the plus c right here. Uh, I'll just save the plus c for the last step. Now what I'm doing here is I'm going to just flip that. I'm going to multiply both sides by 16 over 25, right? Flip the 25 over 16 to the other side. And so what we're doing here is distributing the 16 over 25 to each term. So now is a good time to put the plus C at the very last step. And there we have it. All right, I think I'll stop with that one. Uh, it's already a long enough video. I hope it was a helpful and useful video.